Today we're going to talk about polar coordinates, conic sections and three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. Before we begin, let me remind you that next week we would do not have a lesson. Polar coordinates. You will be familiar to, uh, with using Cartesian coordinates, XY coordinates, to define or to describe the position of a point in two dimensional space. But there's another way to do this. We could use polar coordinates. If I want to describe the position of the point P, I can use the distance from the point P to the origin, which I'm going to call R, and I can measure the angle between the x-axis and this ray, which I'm going to call theta. We need a convention for the angle. When we measure angles anti-clockwise, we're going to say that the angle is a positive number. If we measure angles in a clockwise direction, then we're going to say that we have a negative angle. Think of it like this. Let's suppose we have a ruler which puts zero on the origin. And this is a special mathematical ruler which has negative numbers on as well as positive numbers. And then let's suppose we rotate this ruler anti-clockwise by an angle of 45 degrees. Then we can measure along the ruler the polar coordinates of each point. For example, the point I'm pointing to now has polar coordinates 1, 45 degrees. The distance from the origin is 1, and this ruler makes an angle of 45 degrees. I'm pointing at the point 2, 45 degrees. Now I'm pointing at the point 3.5, 45 degrees. We can also go the other way along the ruler and use negative numbers. This is the point with polar coordinates of minus 1, 45 degrees, and then minus 2, 45 degrees, etc. Put the ruler back where we started with. Let's suppose instead of rotating anti clockwise, we choose to rotate this ruler clockwise. Let's suppose we rotate clockwise by an angle of 30 degrees. Because it's clockwise, we say it's a negative angle. And then we can read points along the ruler. I'm pointing at the point with polar coordinates 1, minus 30 degrees. This is a point 2, minus 30 degrees, and so on. Now, there's two ways, there's more than two ways to describe the position of a point. This is the point with polar coordinates 2, 30 degrees. But we don't have to rotate our, our ruler anti-clockwise by 30 degrees. Let's suppose we rotate it the other way. Let's suppose we rotate it clockwise by minus 330 degrees. Then the ruler would end up in the same place. So this point also has polar coordinates 2, minus 330 degrees. Another idea, this point just here. I could rotate my ruler 30 degrees anti-clockwise and then I could go minus 2 along the ruler. This point has polar coordinates minus 2, 30 degrees. Imagine we have a ruler like this. Or I could rotate the ruler 210 degrees, so then the ruler sits like this, and then this point would lie at plus 2 on the ruler. So two ways to describe this point, this is 2, 210 degrees, it's also minus 2, 30 degrees. And of course the, the difference between these two angles is 180 degrees. For example, find all of the polar coordinates of the point 230 degrees. We start with a choice. We can either use plus 2 or we can use minus 2. 
First, we'll talk about using R is equal to plus two. Then we have 30 degrees, or we can go all of the way around, 30 degrees plus 360 degrees. This is 30 degrees, or I could measure around like this. This is 390 degrees. Or I could do 30 degrees plus 720, go all the way around twice and then another 30 and so on. 30 plus 1080 degrees. Or we go the other way. Previously we said we had minus 330, that would be 30 minus 360. Or I could do 30 minus 720 and so on. If I used r is equal to minus two, the first angle needs to be 180 degrees more than the other first angle. And then we could plus or minus 360 degrees, plus or minus 720 degrees, plus or minus 1080 degrees, and so on, depending on how many times we want to go round and round and round. Something like this. So, all of the coordinates of the point 230 degrees, we could write as 2, 30 plus 360n for some integer n, or we could have minus 2 and then 210 plus 360m for some integer m. Draw the graph of r equal to a. This is all of the points where the distance from the origin to the graph is either a or minus a. We get a circle of radius, absolute value of a. Draw the graph theta equal to b. All of the po points with polar coordinates who have angle equal to b. That's a straight line through the origin. Now, let me point out r equal to 1 and r equal to minus 1 are both equations for the same thing. They're both equations for a circle of radius 1. Theta equal to 30 degrees, theta equal to 210 degrees, theta equal to minus 150 degrees. These are all equations for the same line because the difference between these angles is 180 degrees or a multiple of. Draw the set of points whose polar coordinates satisfy the following conditions. R is between 1 and 2. Theta is between 0 and 90 degrees. Let's take each of these in turn. First, I want to look at R equal to 1. We know what this is. This is a circle of radius 1. So I'm going to draw this. And then I want to look at r equal to 2, a circle of radius 2. OK, I can try to draw this with my mouse. We know that r is between 1 and 2, so we must be between these two circles. Next, I come to theta equal to 0. That's here. And then finally, theta equal to 90 degrees. Start on the x-axis, rotate anti-clockwise by 90 degrees, we get this part. We want the region of points which is between the red, orange, green and blue lines. So we want this region. Let's do another one. Draw the set of points whose polar coordinates satisfy that i is between minus 3 and 2, Theta is equal to 45 degrees. OK. We need a, a circle of radius 3 and a circle of radius 2. And then we must have a line of angle 45 degrees. 
we need to be on the orange line. We need to start at minus three, so start down here, and we need to finish at two. So it must look like this. Draw the set of points whose polar coordinates satisfy the following. R is a negative number and theta is equal to 60. Let's start with theta equal to 60. That looks something like this. We just want the negative part of this. So we just want this part. And finally, draw the set of points whose polar coordinates satisfy the following. Theta is between 120 and 150 degrees. Think about where the line theta equal to 120 degrees is. Think about where the line theta is equal to 150 degrees is. We need to be between these two lines. The picture should look like this. Now we can relate polar coordinates with Cartesian coordinates using these equations. From the picture I've drawn here, it should be easy to see that x must be r cos theta and y must be r sine theta. Also, by Pythagoras, we must have the x squared plus y squared is r squared. And then we can go the other way. We can also see that tan theta must be y divided by x. I'll put these at the top. Convert the polar coordinates, r theta is equal to minus 3, 90 degrees into Cartesian coordinates. I want x, y coordinates, and we know that x is r cos theta and y is r sine theta. So it's just putting in the value of r and putting in the value of theta into here. Because cos 90 degrees is 0 and sine 90 degrees is 1, the answer is 0 minus 3. Let's go the other way. I'm saying we have a point with Cartesian coordinates 5 minus 12, and I want to find polar coordinates. There's many possible answers to this because there's infinitely many polar coordinates for a point. We just need to find one set of polar coordinates. We could use a positive R or a negative R. I'm choosing to use a positive R. That seems easier to me. And then I'm calculating that R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared, and that turns out to be 13. Then I need to find the angle. And it turns out for this example, the easiest equation to use is the equation Y is equal to R sine theta which I can rearrange to theta is equal to inverse sine of y of r. Put the numbers in, type it into your calculator, and the answer comes out as minus 67.38 degrees. So the answer to this problem must be 13 minus 67.38 degrees. It's easy to make a mistake here when we're calculating angles. It helps if we draw a picture, just to see if our answer looks roughly right. Here's a picture of the point with, co with Cartesian coordinates 5 minus 12. Does this angle look about right? Does this look like minus 67? Yes, this looks roughly like minus 67, so it looks like we haven't made a mistake in the previous calculation. Our next topic is the idea of conic sections. Let's suppose we start with a double cone, something like this. And I want to cut this cone in different ways. If I cut the cone using a horizontal plane and I look to see what, what shape we get, we get a circle. We know how to write an equation for a circle. But what if instead of cutting horizontally, I cut at an angle? Then the 
shape we get when we cut like this, imagine moving a knife in the direction of the green plane, or imagine look at the intersection of the green plane and the blue cone, we get a curve which is called an ellipse. Let's make the angle a little bit steeper. In case it's hard to see from this three-dimensional image, I'm going to draw a very quick two-dimensional image. I want to cut in such a way that the cut is parallel to the side of the cone. Then the shape we get when we do this cut is called a parabola. We can increase the steepness of the green plane a little bit more, such that it intersects the top and the bottom. If we do this cut, the curve that we get is called a hyperbola. In this section, we're going to be talking about parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas. First, let's talk about parabolas. Where do we see a parabola? We might see a parabola in a bouncing ball. We might almost see a parabola on a suspension bridge. The shape that ropes hang in a suspension bridge is almost, but actually not exactly a parabola. Why is it not exactly a parabola? You can ask your engineers if you become bridge architects. But for our purposes, let's just assume that if we want to draw a suspension bridge, we're going to be drawing a parabola. And another place that we commonly see parabolas is on satellite dishes. If I drew a straight line on the satellite dish, this curve is a parabola, as I'm, and I'm going to explain why later. So how do we describe a parabola? To describe a parabola, we need a point, which is called a focus, and a line called a directrix. Here's an example of a parabola. The, the focus, I'm going to call the point F, which has coordinates 0p, that's Cartesian coordinates 0p. And the directrix in this picture is the horizontal line y is equal to minus p. If I take the, a point p anywhere on the parabola, it doesn't have to be here, it could be anywhere. Could be this one, could be this one, could be this one, just any point along the the blue parabola, and then if I go straight downwards until I get to the directrix, I'm going to call this point Q, and this point would have polar coordinates x and minus p. The rule for a parabola is that the distance from p to the focus must be the same as the distance from p to the directrix. This is the definition, so let's write this again. A point P lies on a parabola if and only if the distance from P to F is the same as the distance from P to Q. That's what a parabola means. Now, the distance from P to F, we can write down using our distance formula. This must be the square root of x squared plus y minus p squared. When you read, watch this lecture or you read the lecture notes later, you can check back and see why this is true. The distance from P to Q, again, check, must be Y plus P. The rule that we're using for a parabola is that these two distances must be the same. So if we make these two equal to each other, square both sides, multiply everything out, cancel terms, we end up with the standard equation for a parabola. x squared is equal to 4py. Let me show you this picture again. This is x squared is equal to 4py. The focus is the point 0p and the directrix is y is equal to minus p. What does p mean? p means it's the distance here, distance from the focus to the parabola at its closest point. Now we don't have to use this parabola, we might 
have a probability which instead goes downwards. Here we are. Take everything on the previous slide and multiply it by minus one. X squared is equal to minus four PY. The focus is now at zero minus P and the directrix is Y is equal to P. Or we might have a parabola which opens to the right. Take the first parabola I showed you and swap X and Y. So it opens in the X direction instead of in the Y direction. Now we have y squared is equal to 4px instead of x squared is equal to 4py. The focus is now at x is p, y is 0, and the directrix is now x is equal to minus p. Or we could flip this picture horizontally, multiply everything by minus 1, to get a parabola which opens to the left. This is y squared is equal to minus 4px. The focus is at minus p0, and the directrix is x is equal to p. Okay, let's do an example. Find the focus and the directrix of the parabola y squared is equal to 10x. Our equation y squared is equal to 10x looks like one of the equations on the previous slides. It looks like y squared is equal to 4px. What is p then? p must be 2.5. 4 multiplied by 2.5 gives 10. After we know P and after we know which type of parabola we have, we can say that the focus must be at the point 2.50 and the directrix must be the line X is equal to minus Let's do this the other way. I'm telling you a focus and a directrix, and I want to find an equation for the parabola. The focus is at 0 minus 10, and the directrix is y is equal to 10. Straight away, we can say we must have that p is equal to 10, and we must have a, a, a parabola of the form x squared is equal to minus 4py. If you have the lecture notes in front of you, look back at the the four pictures and you can see which one it must be. So the answer to this question must be x squared is equal to minus 40y. Let's move on to talking about ellipses. Let's suppose we had a bit of string which we fixed to our paper using two pins and we did it in, so that it was slacking somewhere. And then let's suppose we use a pencil to draw around. This shape is the ellipse. Where do we see ellipses? We see them in the orbits of planets, and we see them in architecture as well. For example, this building in Denmark uses an ellipse. What's the rule for an ellipse? The rule is that the distance from P to the first focus plus the distance from P to a second focus must be a constant. To describe an ellipse, we need two foci. Foci is just the plural of focus. We could have one focus or two foci. Let's suppose we say that our foci are at minus C0 and at C0. We'll take any point on the ellipse, it doesn't matter where it is on the ellipse, and we'll call that the point x, y. The rule is that distance from P to F1 plus the distance from P to F2 must be a constant. Think back to the picture I showed you before with the string and the pencil. The length of the string doesn't change. That's the same as saying that these, the sum of these two distances doesn't change. So formally, a point x, y lies on ellipse if and only if this equation is true. Just as we did with the parabola, we, could, we can get the standard equation for an ellipse. I'm going to skip the details here. I'll leave this for you to check. 
we get x squared over a squared plus y squared over a squared minus c squared is equal to 1. I want to simplify this a little bit. Instead of writing a squared minus c squared, I want to write a new letter here. I'm going to define b to be the square root of a squared minus c squared. So then we get the standard form, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. And because of the way that b is defined, b must be between 0 and a. So to recap, this ellipse has equation x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. The distance from the center to a focus, or c, must be the square root of a squared minus b squared. That comes from the way we defined b on the previous slide. The foci are at minus c0 and at c0. And the two points where the ellipse crosses the line through the foci are called vertices. Again, because English is a little unusual, we can say one vertex, but we don't say two vertex. We say two vertices. The vertices are at minus a0 and at a0. How do we know that's true? If we put y is equal to 0, then we get x squared over a squared is equal to 1. That's the same as saying x is equal to plus or minus a. Or we could rotate that picture by 90 degrees by swapping the positions of x and y. Now I have x squared over b squared plus y squared over a squared is equal to 1, where again a is the name of the bigger number and b is the name of the smaller number. Why am I doing this? Why am I always making a be the bigger number? Because I want the center to focus distance equation to stay the same. c is still square root of the bigger number squared minus the smaller number squared. The foci are now at 0 minus c and 0 c. The vertices are 0 minus a and 0 a. Two examples for the first one. x squared over 16 plus y squared over 9 equal to 1. The bigger number is 16. Take the square root of that. We get a equal to 4. Square root of the smaller number gives b equal to 3. The center to focus distance is the square root of 16 minus 9, or square root of 7. The center is at 0, 0. It's always at 0, 0. The foci are minus c0 and c0. So that's minus root 7, 0 and root 7, 0. And the vertices are at minus a0 and a0. So minus 4, 0 and 4, 0. Let's do another ellipse. Now, x squared over 16 plus y squared over 25 is equal to 1. Now, the bigger number is 25. Now we want to have a is 5 and we want b to be 4. The center to focus distance, again, it's square root of a squared minus b squared. Here it's 3. Center, always at 0, 0. Because the number under y squared is bigger than the number under x squared, the foci must be on the y-axis. So at 0 minus c and at 0 c. And the vertices the same, 0 minus a and then 0 a. Let's move on to hyperbolas. Where do we see those? We see those on cooling towers. These curves on the outside of cooling towers are typically hyperbolas. And this building in Japan is built using hyperbolas. For hyperbolas, again, we need two foci. But now the rule is slightly different. Instead of saying that the sum of these two distances must be a constant. Now we are insisting that the difference between these two distances is equal to a constant. 
And because we don't know which one of these is going to be bigger, depending on if we're on the left curve or the right part, we need to add absolute value signs are here. So formally, the point xy is on the hyperbola if and only if the difference between the, norm, the distance from p to f1 and the distance from p to f2 is always a constant. If we put the coordinates into this equation, the difference between the two distances, rearrange this, make a new variable called b, just as we did before, then we end up with the standard equation for a hyperbola. I'm skipping details here deliberately. x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. So it's almost the same as the equation for an ellipse, but now we have a minus sign instead of a plus sign. So let's recap. This hyperbola I was talking about, x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. For an ellipse, a needed to be bigger than b. For a hyperbola, it doesn't matter which number is bigger. The center to focus distance, c, is the square root of a squared plus b squared. For an ellipse, we had a minus sign just here, and that was why we had to always have that a was bigger than b. For hyperbola, because we have a plus here, it doesn't matter which of these numbers is bigger. And then the rest is the same. The foci are minus c and c, minus c0 and c0. The vertices are minus a0 and a0. We could rotate this picture 90 degrees and swap to positions of x and y. And literally, I've swapped x and y just here. So instead of x squared over a squared, I have y squared over a squared, and then minus x squared over b squared is equal to 1. Centre to focus distance, that stays the same. The foci are now on the y-axis, 0 minus c, 0 c, and the vertices are also on the y-axis, 0 minus a and 0 a. So just to recap, for an ellipse, we have, must have a plus in the standard equation, and then the center to focus distance must have a minus sign in it. For a hyperbola, it's the other way around. A minus sign in the standard equation, but a plus in the center to focus distance equation. First of two examples. The hyperbola x squared over 4 minus y squared over 5 equal to 1. A is 2, the first number. B, the second number, is root 5. Center, always at 0, 0. The center to focus distance, we can calculate, it must be 3. So the foci are minus 3, 0 and 3, 0. The vertices are minus A, 0 or minus 2, 0. And A, 0, that's 2, 0. And one more hyperbola. Y squared over 9. Square root of 9 is 3, minus x squared over 16. Square root of 16 is 4. So here, a is 3, b is 4. The center to focus distance, we can calculate, is 5. And so the foci are at 0 minus 5 and 0, 5. The vertices are at 0 minus 3 and 0, 3. Just to check this, let's suppose we put x is equal to 0. Then we would have just y squared over 9 is equal to 1. That's the same as saying that y must be 3 or minus 3 if x is 0. Why are we interested in these? Because they have useful reflective properties. A parabola for, to start with has the property that Rays which originate at the focus are bounced off the parabola as parallel lines. And for example, this is used in a car headlight. We put the light bulb at the focus of a parabolic mirror. The light shines out of the, the light bulb, is reflected off the parabolic mirror, 
and then leaves the car headlight as parallel rays. Another place this is useful is on satellite dishes. We have some satellite up in orbit which is beaming our television signals down. These come into the parabolic dish as parallel rays and then they're all bounced off towards the focus. So we build the satellite dish with its receiver at the focus of the dish. An example in architecture, this is actually a photo taken in San Francisco. This is called a whispering dish. It's one of two whispering dishes. The other one is off to the right. And these are constructed in such a way that if somebody sits on the seat, their head is on the focus of the parabolic dish. And then if the person sitting in the seat talks, the sound of their voice bounces off the whispering dish, is projected forward as horizontal lines towards the second dish, which is not shown in the picture, and then is bounced towards the focus of the second dish, which is where the next person sits. An ellipses. If an ellipse has the special property that rays which start at one focus are bounced off the ellipse towards the other focus. So for example, if you were in a room shaped like an ellipse, and let's suppose you stood on a focus and your friend stood on the other focus, then you could talk to each other. Even if the room was crowded with other people, the sound of your voice would reflect off the walls of the room and would reflect to your friend. Or if we had a subway tunnel, a metro tunnel shaped like this, again, these two people could talk to each other. The most, perhaps the most famous room in the world, which is shaped like an ellipse, is this one, which I guess you recognize. The architects who built this room understood the mathematics of ellipses. And what is, what are the reflective properties of a hyperbola? The properties are that if we, sh if we take a ray, which is going towards one focus, it's reflected off one half of a hyperbola towards the other focus. And this is used for, this is used for example in telescopes. This is a very simple telescope using two mirrors. I have a parabolic mirror and a hyperbolic mirror. And it's done in such a way that Yes, just here. The green spot is the focus of the parabola and it's also one of the foci of the hyperbola. Light comes into the telescope, it's bounced off the parabolic mirror towards the focus of the parabolic mirror. So it's, it's bounced towards this green spot I've just drawn. And then the second mirror, the hyperbolic mirror, takes light which is directed towards one of its foci and, and, sorry, and reflects it to the other focus. The third and final topic for today's lesson is three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. We can describe the position of a point in three-dimensional space using three numbers. How far along the x-axis we go, how far along the y-axis we go, and then how far along the z-axis we go. So for example, the point A, if we started at the origin and we wanted to get to A, we can go along the x-axis too. We can go along a direction parallel to the y-axis, 
minus one, opposite direction from the y-axis, and we don't go in the same direction as the z-axis. This point has coordinates two minus one zero. If I started at the origin and I wanted to get to B, I could go one along the x direction, one along the y direction, and then up two. So one, one, two, and so on. When we draw a three-dimensional coordinate system on two-dimensional paper, we need a convention for which directions these axes point in. And we use the left hand rule. So just imagine you hold your hand up in the same way that I'm holding it in front of my camera with this, my second finger bent. I'm gonna rotate my, thing, my hand so that my second finger is pointing in the same direction as the X axis. My first finger is pointing in the same direction as the Y axis. And then my thumb will point in the same direction as the Z axis. Anytime I draw something in three-dimensional space, just imagine holding your left hand in front of it and understanding which way is the x-axis pointing, which way is the y-axis pointing, and which way is the z-axis pointing. There's another way to think about it using your right hand. You can imagine that the fingers on the right hand point from the x-axis to the y-axis, and then your thumb points in the z-axis. But I think the left-hand rule is easier to understand. If we set x equal to 0, and we let y and z be any numbers, we would get this plane, the y-z plane. Instead, we could say, what happens if we say that y must be 0, but x and z can be any numbers? We get this plane. This is called the xz plane. If we insist that z must be 0, we get the xy plane. We put them all together. We don't have to be using the number 0. We could use different numbers. Here I've drawn the plane y equal to 3 and the plane z is equal to 5. All the points where z is equal to 5 make up this blue plane, which of course goes to infinity in every direction. The line where these two planes intersect is the line where y is equal to 3 and z is equal to 5. But x could be any number. Um, a, a scan from the textbook Thomas's Calculus, which I've recommended. Z greater than or equal to zero means the half space, that's the top half of the space, where Z is a positive number. X equal to minus three, that's a plane. Z equal to zero, so we must be in the XY plane, but insisting that X is less than zero and Y is greater than zero. This is called the second quadrant in the xy plane. Um, look at e next. If y, if we say that y must be between minus one and one, we have some sort of infinite slab between two planes. And the bottom one, if we say that y must be minus two and z must be two, that's a line where two planes intersect. Which points intersect, which points satisfy x squared plus y squared equal to 4 and z is equal to 3? z equal to 3, we recognize this. This is the equation of a horizontal plane. x squared plus y squared is equal to 4. Again, we recognize this. This is the equation of a circle of radius 2. So we want the points which satisfy both of these equations. It must be the circle of radius 2, which is inside the plane of height three. The set of all points x, y, z in three dimensional space is called R three. X is a number in the real numbers. Y is a number in the real numbers. 
and z is also a number in the real numbers. So we might think of this set as r, 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 or a neater way to write it, r cubed. Just as in two-dimensional space, we also have a formula for the distance between two points. Same idea as before, we're taking the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared, and now we add the extra z terms plus z2 minus z1 squared. I'll write this at the top. We can use this to calculate the distance between the point 215 and the point minus 230. All we're doing is we're putting these numbers into the formula. I will leave it for you to check. The answer is 3 square root of 5. In the exams, you will not have a calculator. You will not need a calculator. If you do a, a calculation like this, you should give your answer in the form 3 square root of 5. We don't need to worry about the exact value. Anybody in Turkey who had a calculator could do the final step. That's not impressive. The, the impressive part is correctly getting 3 square root of 5 here. I want to talk briefly about spheres. The centre of this sphere, I'm going to call the point x0, y0, z0. And the radius of this sphere, I'm going to call A. A point x, y, z is on the sphere. Here's the rule. If the distance between P0 and P is always equal to A. And then from that, combining that with our distance formula, we find that the standard equation for a sphere of radius A centered at x0, y0, z0 is this. x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared plus z minus z0 squared is equal to A. For example, find the center and the radius of the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 3x minus 4z plus 1 is equal to 0. Now this is not in the same form as the standard equation which is at the top of the slide. We need to rearrange our equation so that it looks like the standard form. And to do this I'm going to use the fact that x minus b squared is equal to x squared minus 2b plus b squared. Now let's suppose we know 2b and I want to get b squared. How do I go from 2b to b squared? I'm going to take my number 2b, I'm going to divide by 2, and then I'm going to be squaring it. That's the method we're going to be used. Take the number, divide by 2, and then square it. OK, so we're starting with x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 3x minus 4z plus 1 is equal to 0. Move all of the numbers to the right, and then combine the x terms, the y terms, and the z terms. I want to use x minus b squared is x squared minus 2b plus b. So I need to add something and subtract it. So as I said before, we take the 3, we divide it by 2, and then we're going to square it. That's going to give us 9 over 4. And we're going to take the 4 here, the minus 4, divide it by 2, and then we're going to square it. Minus 4 over 2 is 2 plus minus 2, and then square, we get 4. So what I'm doing is I'm doing plus 9 over 4 minus 9 over 4 here, and I'm doing plus 4 minus 4. That's where the numbers come from. Because I'm adding a, a number and I'm subtracting the same number, it doesn't change anything. 
move all of the numbers to the right and we're left with this. Now we have something squared plus something squared plus something squared. Because we put the right numbers in, the first bracket is x plus 3 over 2 squared and the final bracket is z minus 2 squared. And now this looks like the standard form. So what do we know? 21 over 4 must be the same as a squared. Minus x0 must be the same as plus 3 over 2. x0 must be minus 3 over 2. Minus y0, well, here is just a 0. And minus z0 is the same as minus 2. So z0 must be 2. So the center must be minus 3 over 2, 0, 2. And the radius must be the square root of 21 over 4, which we can write as root 3, root 7 over 2. Let's do one more example. Find the center and the radius of the, of the sphere. x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 6x minus 6y plus 6z is equal to 7. Same trick as before. 6 divided by 2 is 3 and then square it, we get 9. We're going to be using the number 9. Here's the whole calculation I'm showing to you all at once. I'm grouping all of the x terms, all of the y terms, all of the z terms together. And then I'm doing plus 9 minus 9, and then again plus 9 minus 9, and plus 9 minus 9. Move these odd numbers, these minus 9 minus 9 minus 9 over here. And was there a mistake there? Let me see. I'll have to check that later. I suspect there might be a mistake there. And because we put the correct number 9 in, the brackets become x plus 3 squared plus y minus 3 squared plus z plus 3 squared is equal to some number, which I'm now thinking is wrong. So then we can read it off. The center must be at minus 3. Minus x0 is the same as plus 3 at 3 and at minus 3, and the radius is whatever it turns out to be. And one final example, which I've taken from the textbook, which I recommended, Thomas's calculus book. Here are some geo geometric interpretations of inequalities and equations involving spheres. If I said x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than 4, that means the interior of the sphere, not including the sphere, just what's inside the sphere. If I change that to less than or equal, it's a solid ball. It's the sphere and everything which is inside the sphere. If it was greater than 4, and it's, whatever, it's all of the points which are outside of the sphere, if I said equal to 4, that's a sphere, but with the extra condition that z is negative, that's just the bottom half of the sphere, the lower hemisphere. And then because I've been deliberately talking quickly this week, we come to the end. In the next lesson, we will talk about vectors, the dot product, and the cross product. Let me remind you that there is no lesson next week. Are there any questions?
Okay, so if if I was teaching this lesson in a, in a classroom, the material I've just done would take me about four hours, writing on the board, explaining all of the steps, even the ones which are less important. Because I've done this in an hour, I'm relying on you to reread the bits which are unclear to you. Some of this will be easy for you, some of this will might be a little bit more tricky. You need to spend the time studying the bits you find difficult and if you want extra help I'm available. Ask me in this chat, ask me on the discussion board, I'm available to help you on any bit that you think you need extra help on. Thank you. 